so hello guys welcome back to our youtube channel so today we will be going to discuss about inflammation okay so what do you think what is inflammation it is any disease or it is any pathological condition so let me tell you inflammation is neither a disease so it is mainly the defense mechanism of our body in response to eliminate or limit the spread of injurious agent which enter inside your body as you know whenever anything enter inside our body our immune system is start fighting against it and our immune system wants to eliminate such agents from our body so we know the normal process of our immune system whenever any pathogen any virus any bacteria enters to our body so first of all what happens first of all our body recognize that it is a foreign antigen and our body is start making antibody against it and to remove such factors you know all the process include the movement of the platelets the movement of the monocytes the movement of the macrophages and these process include diapedesis the movement of cells from one place to another where they are required so in all these process to remove such infectious agents we involve different kind of cells so it means in inflammation we also involve cells and you know whenever we have some infective agent in our body our body first of all wants to kill it and then want to remove it first of all there will be the death of such cells which are get infected and the death cells are called necrosed cells or such tissues are called necrosed tissues so we can say that it is a body defense reaction in order to eliminate or limit the spread of injurious agent which is followed by necrosed cells and tissues or we can say that inflammation is a local response of leaving tissues to any injury from any agent okay so let's see the complete definition of inflammation means the complete medical term definition of inflammation so we can say that inflammation is a complex stromal vascular response to injury as i already said that inflammation is the local response of the leaving tissues to any injury from any agent why we say local response because you are very clever you already know if something hit to your arm inflammation will not be in your legs inflammation will be in your arm only means the part which is being exposed to any injurious agent only that part will be affected only injury will be to that particular part so that's why it is a local response of the living tissues to injury from any agent and this injury leads to stromal vascular responses and i, I already told you what is its aim to eliminate the injurious agent no the injurious agent can be infective agent like bacteria virus some toxins such as fungi and parasites which leads to the death of tissue or death of cells which can be tissue necrosis or cell necrosis and you know the death of tissues and cells what is the major reasons for the death of these tissues or cells the reason is ischemia because there is not proper blood supply to that particular origin and the cells become deficient from the nutrition deficient from oxygen means all survival conditions or normal survival condition which are required by any cells are destroyed they are not able to get any further oxygen they are not able to get further anything which are being required by a living cell to continue their life further so 
but there also can be some another reason for tissue necrosis it can be heat can be cold can be radiation can be mechanical trauma can be some chemical agent which can be organic and inorganic right. now please see here as we can see that it is the elimination of the injurious agent and limit the spread of injurious agent means limit we must limit the spread of such injurious agent remember the word limit the spread of injurious agent suppose if you have infection in a single cell so what our body want to do it our body want to synchronize in such a manner so that this infection must not spread to the nearby cells or to the neighborhood cells. And at last, what our body wants to do to restore our all the functions means whatever the cells are being destroyed, they want to restore their function. So what you will say regarding inflammation, we will say, okay, let's skip this definition and i want to tell you a normal simple definition please take a copy and a pen and write down the definition that inflammation is a body defense mechanism reaction which is characterized by local response of leaving tissues to injury from any agent which main task is to eliminate or limit the spread of infectious agent or injurious agent limit or spread of the injurious agent which is followed by removal of these necrotized cells removal of these necrotized cells and restoration of damaged tissue and restoration of damaged tissue so this is the exact meaning of definition if someone asks you what does it mean definition or what does it mean or the definition of inflammation you must say these things now as we know the common terminology for inflammation you know the word inflammation comes from the greek language and the suffix for is itis i t i s so whenever you say any term which ends with itis it means inflammation such as cholestitis colitis yes so these are all examples of inflammation next thing is that that if inflammation is a protective mechanism then what must be its aims i already told you that it is a delimited of area of damage what does it mean it means limit the spread of injurious as a function number one function number two elimination of injurious agent and third restoration of damaged functions of the body that is also called repair So based on the type of uh, tissue, the reaction can be normergic, hypergic and hypergic. So, then we have due to morphological type, we have exudative and proliferative. Do not confuse. During exam, you will say that we have three types of inflammation, alteration, exudation and proliferation. But no, let me tell you. The process alteration is only limited up to the death of cells or tissues means necrosis limited up to the process of necrosis only it does not involve any morphological type of inflammation morphological type of inflammation include only two things first is exudate means exudation and second proliferation means proliferative then proliferative is further divided into interstitial granulomatous polyps and condylomas and around foreign bodies or parasites then granulomatous is further divided into infectious non-infectious and a non-utility 
immune and non-immune. You know these all things from your microbiology and immunology. Then based on macrophageal granuloma, we have epithelioid granuloma, gland cell granuloma, mixed cell granuloma, specific and non-specific. You already know from your previous year subject. Because if I will explain these basics here, it will be a very long video and you will feel bored. Now, five signs of inflammation. You must know we have five signs of inflammation. So, we have heat, redness, swelling, pain and loss of function. Basically, you must remember calor, river, tumor, dolor and loss of function. So, for temperature, for fever, we say heat. So, heat is, this is calor. Then we have redness for r, redness, r, rubber, rubber, swelling, you know, tumor, seems like a swelling, so tumor, we have tumor. Pain. For pain, what tablet we generally eat? Dolo. So, dollar. Then, loss of functions. We know whenever we will have some pathological condition inside our body which leads to reactive changes and metabolic changes, of course, the function will be lost. And, you, and we know one of the example is ischemia. And those functions are deficiency of nutrition and oxygen which leads to the death of cells or tissues. So that's all. You must know five signs of inflammation which are calor, rubber, tumor, dolor and loss of function. Okay. Let's see the morphogenesis of the inflammation. So let me tell you that According to the morphological types, we have only two types. The first one is exudation and second one is proliferation. But do you think we will see first exudation? No. This exudation is the result of alteration. So means we were having alteration. That's why we are on the phase of exudation. So. First of all, let's see what does it mean, alteration. I already told you that alteration is the damage of tissue. It is the initial phase of inflammation. Means it is the just like an activity factor. It is the initial phase. It does not include under morphological changes. We do not find any morphological changes on this stage. It is just an initial phase which is manifested by the dystrophy. What does it mean dystrophy you already know? Because it is the base of pathology. So it is the dystrophy of parenchyma and stroma of organs up to necrotic changes. You already know if you have some organ, let's say this is the an imaginary organ. So at the periphery, this reason is the parenchyma of any reason and this part is the stroma. So, it leads to changes maybe in parenchyma, maybe in stroma and maybe in both. And this changes only up to the necrosis. So, also we have types of alteration. We have primary alteration and we have secondary alteration. So, what is the difference between primary alteration and secondary alteration? So, let me tell you that primary alteration is the direct effect of any inflammatory agent so it means it will depend if okay if it will depend on the type of inflammatory agent so it means it will also depend on the intensity it will also depend on the quality and it will also depend on the location and the damaged area. A simple example for this thing is that suppose if the injurious agent come into contact with your skin of forearm, okay, and the amount was very low, the amount was very low, okay, the amount was very low, and the quality of 
such factors was also very low so the damage will also be very low but suppose but suppose another situation the infectious agent suppose the infectious agent or injurious agent is some thing is strong something is strong something sharp and it contains some infective agent suppose someone hit you by a knife into your hemopericardium which were having some very injurious bacteria or virus on that sharp object so you see the location hemopericardium means location of our heart or of our cavity so in this situation the location is of very dangerous the area of damage is also very big and it also contain very dangerous infectious agent it means the primary alteration factors depend on the intensity on the quality on the location and how much area is being damaged by that factor now let's discuss about secondary alteration secondary alteration is occurs under some physical and chemical factors and some vascular reactions so it can be nervous it can be humoral endocrine and immune reactions let us discuss about exudation what does it mean exudation so exudation is uh, basically the reactive changes in our blood system which leads to you know suppose let me give you simple example before exudation suppose let me change color suppose we have this blood vessel and inside this blood vessel there is some injury to you okay or some infectious what will happen what will happen there will be the migration of platelet and monocyte aggregation then there will be the migration of macrophages to here and engulfment of this thing but before this when there was infectious as in before monocyte and platelet adhesion or during the monocyte and platelet adhesion inside this layer inside the intima there is another layer which is called endothelium inside that endothelium there is the damage of the endothelium and whenever there is damage in the endothelium there is increased vascular permeability and that increases vascular permeability which leads to this plasma exudation and migration of these cells means there was endothelium damage and due to that endothelium damage there is migration of platelet and monocytes and then migration of macrophage which leads to phagocytosis and leads to formation of exudate so let's see what's the definition so definition says it is a reaction of microvascularity with the changes of rheological properties of blood what does it mean rheological properties of the blood means natural properties of blood the normal functions which our blood is performing that all the functions are being changed then we have symptoms of increased vascular permeability i already told you damage of endothelium after the damage of endothelium there will be increased vascular permeability which leads to plasma exudation and immigration of cells and which cells immigration initially platelet and monocytes and the migration of macrophages which leads to phagocytosis and formation of exudate do you understand what does it mean exudate let me tell you suppose we we have exudate here we have some damage and after that we see this is our exudate so it is a muddy fluid you see mud so exudate is look like a mud remember exudate look like a mud okay 
and exudate will contain what exudate will contain yes the agent which was the reason for this exudation so means inflammatory histogens it will include inflammatory histogens the blood cells which exit from the small blood vessels and reach to the site of inflammation so if someone will ask you that what is the definition of exudate so you must say that exudate is a bloody fluid which is rich in proteins which include blood cells and inflammatory histogens because these all things comes from the small blood vessels to the site of inflammation where the injury takes place initially now you see that these processes are the base of exudation we already know first of all if something enters to our blood stream what will happen reactive changes means reaction of microvascular means micro vessels which are which will impair blood rheology means which will impair the normal functions of our blood system whenever there will be the damage to the endothelium or damage or disturbance of any of our blood functions our vascular permeability will increase at the microvascular bed which leads to the exudation of blood plasma component which blood plasma component as you already told you we have two first one is platelet and second one is monocyte then we have immigration of blood cells mainly macrophages and function of macrophages is phagocytosis you see phagocytosis which leads to formation of exudate and inflammatory cell infiltration okay next thing is proliferation so proliferation is the last stage or we can say it is the final phase of inflammation which leads to reparative regeneration of tissues where initially the inflammation is start means at the site of alteration so we can say that proliferation is the final phase of inflammation provide reparating tissue regeneration and site of alteration so the proliferation is characterized by proliferation of inflammatory cells and differentiation and cell transformation now what does this process means you already know that in inflammation we have some inflammatory cells so you know whenever there is migration of the macrophages and engulfment these macrophages are being transformed into some special cells which are called epithelioid cells which are called epithelioid cells so there is a migration of the macrophage cells into the epithelioid cells after this these epithelioid cells or gland cells then beta lymphocytes transform into plasma cells so we have beta lymphocyte which transform into plasma cells which transform into plasma cells then we have some cambial mesenchymal cells which can be transformed into fibroblast so you know what is our main journey our main journey is the transformation of these macrophages up to the fibroblast this is our requirement because if there will be no fibroblast there will be no formation of junctions between the pathological condition and the reparative tissue you know suppose suppose let's take example suppose this is the final border we have this side repairing and this is the all material which were responsible for inflammation and all which comes to protect our body if we will not have fibroblast if we will not have fibroblast so we will never be able to differentiate between two regions our body will not be able to make a clear cut boundary if there will be no clear cut boundary so infectious agents are also now in contact so what will be the benefit of all process our main task is to remove but to remove we must 
make a boundary or must close it in something so that it cannot come out again. So what will happen? So these fibroblast cells make a clear cut boundary and it will make a fibrous cap here and this fibrous cap this fibrous cap here will contain this side newly growing tissue that tissue are called granulation tissues the tissues are called granulation tissues remember granulation tissues are only found at the site of injury wound or any reparative pathological condition they are not found normally inside any living organism so and by this fibrous cap we divide this pathological area and it also being covered by a cap so that the agent cannot come out from it and inside this it form a necrotic pore which necrotic pore contains everything what it contain it contain the blood components it contain the platelet it contain the monocyte it contains the macrophages and it also contain the infective agent which was responsible for this complete process now this is the microscopical picture of acute viral hepatitis a under the microscope but we write alternative inflammation we write alternative inflammation because on this slide we cannot see any changes on the slide except death of cells except death of some cells which is being called necrosis means it is clear by scientific point of view that when we see only the necrosis of some cells and do not see any other morphological criteria so we cannot say that it is part of severe inflammation so it is only the initial phase of inflammation which is called alternative inflammation and this is the condition under the acute viral hepatitis a now exudative inflammation in exudative inflammation let me tell you that uh, we have some fluid which are exudate i already told you that exude what is exudate i already told you right now it is a muddy fluid yet which is rich in protein okay what else blood cells and inflammatory histogens okay so we have two type of exudative inflammation means exudate type of fluid basically exudate is a fluid so we have two type of fluid one is transudate and one is exudate what is transudate so transudate is the plasma of the blood without changes in vascular permeability because we know the base for the exudation was the reaction of the microvascular changes with impaired blood rheological properties but this was the function for exudate because exudate, basically exudative inflammation mainly contain exudate if it is exudation means it will contain transudate but we also have another fluid that sorry if we have exudative inflammation of course it will contain exudate but we also have another fluid that is transudate so it is a differentiation what other fluids cause if it is not exudate exudate also leads to inflammation transudate are non inflammatory fluid then transudate contain low protein content and exudate contain high proteins they mainly contain fibrinogen and some coagulation factors they contain a small number of cells they contain large number of cells and the example of transudate such as edema in congestive heart failure whenever there is heart failure you know that we have edema and basically in our legs and purulent exudate that is pus and the best example for exudative inflammation is 
you have sometimes some furuncles, carbuncles, some skin disorders. You know some skin disorders and you see some papillae or patches filled with pus, yellow color or green color fluid and you start to emulate them. That is called pus and it is a type of purulent exudate. That is exudate. It means that is an inflammatory fluid. It leads to the changes of blood rheological properties. There is high protein content and it contains fibrinogen and other population factors. And it contains large number of cells, mainly inflammatory cells and also parenchymal cells. Now let's see exudative inflammation. So, uh, Exudative inflammation is of many types. We, it may be serous, fibrinous, purulent, putrefactive, hemorrhagic, mixed, and atrophic. So, first of all, let's discuss about exudative inflammation. So, you know that exudative inflammation contains, first of all, what it will contain? Remember, it will contain, it will contain exudate. And exudate will contain of different types of cells okay and depend on the type of exudate means it can be serous it can be fibrinous it can be purulent purulent i already told you that first and remember in purulent mainly neutrophils are found so predominance of neutrophils is being found in case of exudative purulent inflammation Okay, then we have putrefactive inflammation, hemorrhagic inflammation, mixed inflammation, and catheteral inflammation. So you can see that etiology is by some thermal and chemical factors which have herpes labialis, herpes juster, localization that is serous membrane, mucous membrane of skin, and also some other spaces of our body. And it can be chronic and the final main thing is that it leads to sclerosis. So this is the slide of the serous inflammation on which uh, we can see that it is being found on the mucosa. You can see that we can we can see serous inflammation on the mucosa membrane here. It is the mucosa membrane. So as you can see clearly and is basically on the internal organs i will tell you then next part is fibrinous so inside fibrinous you must remember the main component is fibrin do not forget about fibrin whenever you are talking about fibrinous inflammation please remember fibrin it contains large amount of fibrin Again, you have some etiology and the localization where is being found. But our main task in fibrinous inflammation, you must say that exudate contains of large amount of fibrin and is mainly of two type: Kraupas inflammation and bacteric inflammation. The main task is this. You must differentiate between Kraupas inflammation and bacteric inflammation. So, let's see about Kraupas inflammation type of fibrinous inflammation. First of all, if whenever we talk about fibrinous inflammation, what you will remember from fibrinous, the word fibrin. It contains large amount of fibrin. Second, it have Kraupas and diphtheric. In the Kraupas form, it is basically found on the mucous membrane which are loosely related to the underlying tissues. Okay, there is cylindrical epithelium and only there is superficial necrosis of the tissue. Suppose you have some tissue here, there is only superficial necrosis of tissues. Remember, if you will remember these points, you will be able to easily learn another type of fibrinous inflammation which is diphtheric inflammation. So, in the Kraupas inflammation, what we have, we have the necrosis of the underlying tissue, superficial necrosis and 
main component is fibrin so deposition of fibrin in the necrotic mass suppose you have necrotic mass here and in this necrotic mass you will find fibrin you will find fibrin from the word fibrinous remember please fibrin and then you will have some conditions like fibrinous pericarditis you can see fibrinous pericarditis this fibrinous pericarditis in this fibrinous pericarditis we will able to see the grayish yellow rough masses you can see here grayish yellow rough masses so these gray yellow rough masses are present in the form of strands and this type of heart is called shaggy heart but remember this condition we can easily recover we can easily remove such masses so when we see such condition under the microscope we can see that the pericardium is thickened and edema okay and there are fibrinous deposits so you can see on this slide this is under the microscope so this is the example of fibrinous pericarditis and sometimes in the later conditions there is some calcification of some substances mainly of calcium and sometimes petrification means uh, or sometimes ossification when in this condition the heart is called stone and we also have some another examples such as graupus laryngitis trachytitis and bronchitis for graupus inflammation so you can see this is the example of laryngitis trachytitis and bronchitis and then we have fibrinous inflammation we have also graupus inflammation this is the graupus pneumonia so uh, in the graupus pneumonia it is the basically the disease which is caused by a bacteria clapsilla the complete name is pneumococcus clapsilla and this is basically the type of lobar pneumonia when you will read pathology further you will find a separate topic regarding pneumonia and you will read about different type of pneumonia lobar pneumonia lobular pneumonia and you must not confuse lobar pneumonia with lobular pneumonia please and you will find there that in the this type of pneumonia okay lobar type of pneumonia we have crowpus inflammation the affected lung becomes of gray color gray color so you see gray color on the lung so such gray color on the lung is called gray hepatization stage of lobar pneumonia you will find stage gray hepatization stage and red hepatization stage so when you will see the gray color of the lungs this stage is called gray hepatization stage and on the microscope we see that in the lumen of alveoli in the lumen of alveoli we see the presence of fibrin and leukocyte fibrin and leukocytes this is also called this is also called gray hepatization stage so when you will see from your eyes and you see the gray color of the lobes of the lung you will say it is the gray hepatization stage but if you will see under the microscope how you will differentiate that it is the gray hepatization it says you will see in the lumen of alveoli lot of fibrin and leukocytes now i told you another type is diphtheric we have only two graupus and diphtheric graupus have some example fibrinous pericarditis fibrinous laryngitis trachytitis bronchitis and graupus pneumonia now diphtheric remember what i told you initially regarding crowpus inflammation that crowpus inflammation have cylindrical epithelium shallow superficial necrosis fibrin deposit in the necrotic mass and fibrinous thill film contain fibrin and polymorphonuclear leukocyte which can be easily detached here everything will be opposite crowpus were having 
सिलेंड्रिकल एपिथीलियम डिपथेरिक हैव स्ट्रेटिफाइड स्पेमस एपिथी Crowpus were having loosely related underlying tissue, but they are closely other underlying tissue to each other. In Crowpus, shallow superficial swelling. Here we will have deep necrosis of tissues or cells. There were deposition of the fibrin component containing fibrin and only polymorphonuclear site. air fibrin will contain white blood cells necrotic tissue and fibrin in crowpus inflammation the layer was easily detached but in diphtheric inflammation the layer is hardly detached and which result into deep ulcer so what you will do according to my point of view take a copy and pen and write like this right here crowpus inflammation right here Diphtheric inflammation. First point. Point number one. Right. What you will write? Cylindrical epithelium. Stratified squamous. Point number two. What you will write? That superficial shallow necrosis, deep necrosis. Tissues are loosely connected. Tissues are otherly connected, close to each. Number four. Fibrin film contain only fibrin and polymorphonuclear sites. Here, fibrin film contain fibrin, white blood cells, and necrotic tissue. The layer easily detached. The layer hardly detached. And it is also your exam question and is checkpoint many teacher questions like this. So to remove your confusion, you must do things like this. Then we have. Next type, I already told you that exudative inflammation have many types: serous, fibrinous, purulent, putrefactive, hemorrhagic, mixed, and catheteral. So now we reach to the purulent inflammation. Purulent inflammation is mainly caused by pyogenic bacteria, mainly Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, and also we have some other bacteria. It is found on the skin, mucous membrane, and some internal organs. So what is the main point to remember inside purulent inflammation is the predominance of neutrophils predominant predominance of neutrophils so we have basically two types of purulent inflammation one is limited purulent inflammation and one is diffuse purulent inflammation so in the limited purulent inflammation the first type is abscess and the abscess is also further divided into acute abscess and chronic abscess listen to me very carefully and take a pen and a copy and please write down such information because i cannot write everything inside the slides i must explain everything for your understanding acute abscess have the presence of coat which is enriched with blood vessels and connective tissue and such coat is called pyogenic membrane or granulating wall which is responsible for the production of pus while chronic abscess is the part which is characterized by the presence of peripheral fibrotic capsule and the pus easily and periodically exist and the microflora again recover so means chronic abscess is very severe condition if you will have antibiotic medication the body wants to remove it but it does not have the coat proper coat there will be the no proper pyogenic membrane suppose there will be the no proper pyogenic membrane if there will be no proper pyogenic membrane the fluid will again and again leak out suppose the reason as an staphylococcus coli again staphylococcus coli microflora come out again it will make another inflammation that's like in chronic condition pus leads to condition of sepsis then next is we have this is also under the limited purulent inflammation carbuncal and furuncal you have seen some condition in your life with you yes with you remember your past 
and uh, mm, what is uh, the frontal and carbuncle you know that frontal is the inflammation of the hair follicles mainly of your sebaceous gland and surrounding connective tissue while carbuncle is the necrotic inflammation of the skin or some subcutaneous tissues uh, then we have next inflammation which is uh, oh i missed something i actually forgot that i make another slide and let me tell you on this slide only we also have some diffuse purulent inflammation which include phlegmon cellulitis and empyema the main thing you remember about empyema teacher mainly asks about phlegmon and empyema so you must remember the name of the cellulites so phlegmon uh, we have hard phlegmon and soft phlegmon and what is empyema empyema is basically a purulent inflammation means uh, of course empyema it is a type of diffuse purulent inflammation so whenever there is accumulation of pus in the poorly drained cavities so such condition is called empyema and these cavities already exist in your body such as gold bladder gold bladder contains very big cavity and from that big cavity it is impossible or very hard to drain the pus naturally then your body will not be able to do it and even surgically it is very different very difficult and we need to remove the complete gallbladder in some serious condition then we have hemorrhagic inflammation so hemorrhagic what does it mean it means it means formation of exudate by, by rbc red blood cells by red blood cells so the mechanism which is responsible again that is the increase of microvascular permeability movement of rbc and this state is called diapetosis and you can see that etiology influenza localization here on the mucous membrane and outcomes as you can see the microscopic and microscopic picture of hemorrhagic inflammation and then we have putri putri inside putri inflammation you just know that it is caused by some anaerobic infectious pathogens such as clostridium perfringens if you will know clostridium perfringens that will be enough if you will know clostridium novi inseptigum that will be very nice and it uh, also sometimes cause in some with some aerobic bacteria such as staphylococci or streptococci and it is more common found in wound with extensive crush in injuries so you can say this picture there is a type of putrid type of exudative inflammation means what does it mean putrid whenever you hear the word putrid inflammation you must think about anaerobic infection such as clostridium perfringens clostridium novi and clostridium septicum right now you pass your microbiology exam and you must know about these bacteria okay uh, then we have catheteral inflammation in catheteral inflammation basically this inflammation is by the different type of bacteria and virus and sometimes they leads the combined effect they combine together and leads to some complication so in this basically you know that the fluids are being get combined with each other means suppose in type catheteral serous replaced by mucus then mucus replaced by purulent and purulent get combination with rbcs leads to formation of purulent hemorrhagic this is the condition going in catheteral inflammation then we have mixed inflammation in mixed inflammation we have two type of inflammation together suppose purulent with hemorrhagic means purulent hemorrhagic inflammation but in case of catheteral at a single time exist only one but they transform their phase means serous convert to mucus mucus convert to purulent purulent convert to hemorrhagic but two does not exist together but in mixed two type or more type exist together suppose serous purulent hemorrhagic 
purulent hemorrhage. Then the last type of exudative inflammation is proliferative inflammation. I already told you that this can be due to some physical, chemical and biological factors. It can be acute, it can be chronic, but the its outcome is very important. The outcome is sclerosis. It outcome is sclerosis with development of the development of atrophy. You must know what does it mean atrophy and shrinkage of organ means death of cells and the size of organ will become shorter and shorter day by day and sometimes every hour depend on the state of pathological condition so i already told you that we have some kinds of some types of inflammation which are interstitial inflammation granulomatous specific and non-specific hyperplastic polyps and condylomas inflammation around foreign bodies and parasites so you can see here we can see interstitial inflammation then that's not so important but not so much important because already we have so much we, then we have a proliferative inflammation in proliferative inflammation we have next type is granulomatous inflammation in granulomatous i already give you this description already now we have granulomatous non-specific or non-specific granulomas the type is alveolococcus in the liver and in this uh, alveolococcus in the liver what is important to know about alveolococcus in the liver in this you can see the liver is enlarged means increase in size and the alveolococcus occupies the larger part of the liver you can see alveolococcus and we can see the white dense nodes. You can see such white dense nodes. These white dense nodes, which are look like a tumor. Okay. This is the thing we can see. And then we have specific granulomas. A specific granuloma. Basically, we have tuberculoma, guma, leproma. And remember, many teachers have their favorite question especially our head of department as a maxim favorite question about guma sometimes tuberculoma and lapron so you must remember this question and also scleroma okay so inside the tuberculoma you can see that uh, white to yellow color foci you can see here here see white to yellow color and on the microscope you can see numerous granulomas can be seen which cause caseous necrosis in the center which is surrounded by epithelial and going multinucleative cells and also contain perigolanganhan cells when we stain by gene nelson staining and you know the reason for tuberculoma is mycobacterium tuberculosis and the outcomes of such disease is caseous necrosis then we have guma guma is basically typical for tertiary cyclus and uh, it have the infiltrate which is also called gumatous infiltrate here you will find uh, the node up to one centimeter on the skin basically on the chicken's egg where you can see and we can see yellow yellow like mass that look like aerobic gum under the microbe again we will see caseous necrosis in the center which is surrounded by different granulomatous tissues which contain numerous lymphocytes and plasma cells and its uh, outcomes is multiple gumas and gumatous infiltration then we have lapromas Leproma, you simply know leprosy, which can be tuberculoid leprosy and leperomatous leprosy. So, uh, in this, uh, we have some papules or plaques. 
and mycobacteria are detected if it is tuberculoid and if it is lacrimatus then we can see some skin lesions which is the damage of the skin derivative mainly of sweet and sebaceous glands so you can see damage of sweet and sebaceous glands on the entire face area so on this area you can see the very different type of skin derivatives diffuse character as well as blood vessels we can see and the face look like lion so this face is called lion's face so remember lion's face is in leperomatous leprosy okay then we have scleroma it is the last type so it is basically found on the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, larynx, trachea, soft and hard palate. So we can see that there is the presence of nodules on the skin and mucous membrane and acquire cartilage density and they do not protrude ulceration. The main thing is that. And under the microscope, we see that infiltration is by the granulomatous tissue, granulomatous infiltrate and which have eosinophilic rosal's bodies you can see these colors these colors yeah, and this these colors yes these are eosinophilic rosal's bodies and we evacuated cytoplasm which is also called metalloid cells okay so uh, this was the discussion about the inflammation so now i already told you that we also have uh, the proliferative inflammation the polyp and condylomas it is also a very important and famous question in the pathology what is the difference between polyp and condylomas so let me tell you that polyp is a polyetiological disease while condylomas are mainly caused by hpv means human papilloma virus it is mainly caused by sexual transmission polyps mainly found on the mucous membrane of the stomach colon and uterus while condylomas are found at the border of columnar and squamous epithelium. If you will see such condition macroscopically means from our eyes, we will be able to see some outgrowth and such outgrowth is called fungi form outgrowth on the mucous membrane on the peduncle of white bases. While in case of condylomas, we will see such outgrowth in the form of leaf lower or like a box form in pink color while under the microscope we will see the hyperplastic epithelium means the epithelium increase in thickness and size and in this we will see villous proliferation and outcomes in both inflammatory process and malignization now the last one inflammatory uh, inflammation around foreign bodies and parasites uh, this is mainly due to some external factors which get invasion into the body and leads to again the same process there will be the monocytes adhesion platelet adhesion phagocytes will mean who wants to remove such factors so these may be all asbestol can be any material plastic sponge some cells of foreign bodies okay so that's all for today so thank you for your attention thank you very much good luck for next time